This is the next video in the series on the Blaupunkt SQR23 Monterey. In the very first video of this series, I actually uh, gave a brief overview of the condition of this radio and some of the inputs, and also then disassembled it into this condition. And if you want, you can click up at the top here and take a look at that video. Uh, in another video, I also repaired the cassette assembly um, in order to get that up and running again. That's working just fine. You can also take a look at that by clicking on the link here. Um, but this particular video is about sorting out some of the buttons here on this front face. So what I've done is I have connected this at the back over here to my bench top power supply. As you can see the cable is just on the edge of the frame. And I'm now going to turn this on and let's do a quick test of the state of these buttons. So turning it on immediately goes into the FM mode, which you can see here by the U. I'll try press the M. L. One, two, three, not really working. Ah, four still has a bit of a click. No. Got that to work only just. Five is clicking but not working. Six. Yeah, six is kind of working. Let's see if we can get a stereo broadcast in here so we can actually try the stereo mono button. Oh yeah, that barely worked, but not really. And then of course I knew there were some issues with the tape controls. Right, so the thing to do now is actually to take all of these buttons off. Now, for those of you who are buying these units on uh, eBay and similar sources, be cautious if the seller says to you that it only needs a little bit of contact cleaner to get these buttons up and running. Unfortunately, with this particular model, it's a bit more complicated than that. Um, but yeah, I'm going to take some of these buttons off so we can take a look at exactly how they work and uh, how to fix them. So let me do that now. If you look a bit more closely at these buttons, you'll see over here that, get my pointer, that they're basically connected in in two ways. So here is a white plastic frame that's actually connected to the board and there's transparent plastic in the front that's just clicked into that, which is kind of a housing that holds the black button and the black button moves with a spring inside there. And see over here that on the top and on the bottom, there's a small little um, clip that you can see that's on the white plastic that will stay behind. That's basically holding a little piece. So we have to basically just press on these clips to be able to remove this white piece. Now that's, oh, sorry, the transparent piece. Now that's fine for most of these buttons. You can see over here that these three are pretty easy to get to top and bottom. These three should be fine as well. These three are very, very close to this screen. So I'm going to see if I can remove some of this plastic over here to get easy access to get into the bottom of these three buttons. This one should be fine. And these um, fast forward and rewind buttons you can see over here have also got white plastic clips on the bottom and on the top. And I think I should be able to get into there without any major problems. Right, so let me start uh, disassembling some of these. All right, I've managed to remove the first three buttons, one, two, and three, and let's take a look at how these works. As you can tell, there's obviously a spring inside um, for each one of these. There it is. And then there's this black uh, plastic button, which is the button itself. There we go. And then let's look inside this button. So what you'll see here is that there's this black rubber uh, that's installed here, which has got a small black plastic tip. There we go. Uh, the interesting thing is this is a conductive rubber. And basically it's trying to, when you press this button, short, make a short between this piece and this piece of the rubber and giving it a nice solid click. But as you can see, this thing's falling to one side. So I'm going to remove this rubber from here. And what you'll notice is that this is just a five there we go five millimeter by two millimeter piece of rubber there it sits so two millimeters thick five millimeter diameter but actually it's been damaged at the bottom and i'm not sure if you can see that on camera 
that's coming through or not. But this little inter internal piece of rubber is no longer going back straight. And when I press that down, you can see actually the rubber is torn and it's folding to one side. And that's where the problem lies. These things, of course, are made of unobtainium because of course they are. So we're not going to get uh, exactly the same. So the trick is here to find something else that will be a suitable replacement uh, for these buttons. So I'm going to start putting them over here into my little storage rack just to make sure they don't get mixed up. So that's button number one with its spring. And I'm just going to continue on uh, removing some of these buttons. And let's see how we get on. Right, here we see the construction of this uh, fast forward rewind button. This one's a little different. You can see that it has two springs. And there we go on either side. And then it has this little piece here in the middle, which I'm going to try and remove. There we go, this transparent plastic piece, which is now seems to be getting stuck on their LEDs themselves. I'm sure I'll get it out of there. And it still has that same black plastic uh, behind. So let me work on that one some more. Let's see if I can get it out here. There we go. A little fiddly to get that past the um, LEDs, but it's doable, and you can see over here the exact same problem that this little rubber inside here is just destroyed. Right, onto the eject button. Check button has a very similar mechanism to the um, change sides button, except it doesn't have the two LEDs uh, in the housing. But same rubber and same perish problem. Right, the last three are these four, five, and six buttons over here, which are going to be a bit of a pain. Already, I seem to have found a technique that seems to be working for these top buttons. I can't get the screen off. Basically, I unclip the top half, then I slide a pin down right beside this plastic to try and push on the transparent plastic beneath. There we go. And that then releases the button. Well, that's a lot easier. What a mission. Okay, so we've spent some time looking at what the buttons look like, but what about the radio? And what you'll see if you look closely here is that, in actual fact, all that's happening is that there are two metal contacts here. And basically what that rubber pin is actually doing is just shorting these two to ground to basically send a signal for that pin. So we will clean each of these up with some contact cleaner as well, just to make sure that these pins are nice and clean. Um, but I would like to then turn my attention to the buttons themselves. So let me start with the contact cleaner. I'll do that now and uh, let's clean each of these contacts a little bit so that this all looks a little bit better. I tilt this down and so the product I like to use is this uh, Deoxit D5. Had a lot of success with this as well on volume control pots such as this one. This one was actually quite crackly. 
um, but after a little bit of work um, with this deoxid D5, it's become absolutely quiet. So there we go. And let's just get in there and just clean them straight up, removing any oxidation or any contamination on these contacts. Alrighty, so here we have all the buttons themselves. What I'm going to do, I actually am going to remove each and every one of these um, little pieces of rubber because some of them are broken and those that aren't broken yet will be broken soon. So I'm going to remove them from all of these buttons and we are going to go with an alternate solution um, to solving this problem. So they're quite easy to lift out, there we go. I'll just lift that out and put them here. All in one pile. This one actually still looks pretty good. So. Yep, here's one of the few that's still perfectly fine. Put that in a different pile. Alrighty, and the next job now is to clean all these buttons with a uh, good friend, Windex. I'll just use the regular old Windex, and let's use that now to give just all these button casings a little bit of a clean. Alrighty, so they're all given a bit of a once over and now we need to fix them and this is where I'm going to take an interesting approach. So we know that these buttons here are kind of in two main categories. They're either not almost broken or about to break soon or they are already broken. Now what you can see here as well is that when they break these small little slivers or half moons of, uh, of rubber is what breaks out of this uh, casing. Here you can see a combination of pieces where some of them Already you can see there the half moon has already fallen out and that, that's why when this rubber is pressed it will just tilt to one side. It doesn't go straight down and click anymore. Or some of them it's actually already fallen out in its entirety so there's not really a, a whole lot we can do there. So my plan for these is to go a slightly different uh, approach and that is if you look carefully you'll notice that each of these buttons is a very very same size. Um, if you measure the radius you can see over there, for you metric folks, that's exactly five millimeters. And as well as we measure the depth, let's measure the depth of this thing. There we go. You can see exactly two millimeters of depth. The two by five millimeters, all that is effectively doing is the spring is holding it away. And when it presses against that conductor of rubber that we have over here that's perished, is basically shorting out those two points. So the approach I'm going to take is, I just went on eBay and bought a whole bunch of 5mm conductive rubber pads, which are kind of the same that you get in remote controls or game controllers. And the trick here is to basically just get them to be on, onto the bottom of this button so it can go and short that contact. Now obviously there's a 2mm depth here which I need to fill, and then I'm going to put the pad on top and to be able to connect that. And the best thing I've found that we can use to fill this is just fill this up smoothly with silicon adhesive because that's also the best glue to use to glue those pads. So fill this little hole up flush to the top with silicon adhesive maybe a little bit beyond and then just place that, um, that rubber pad on top and let it dry. That's also going to give it some give so when we press here that the buttons have a tiny little bit of squishiness uh, as they make their contact. Alrighty so that's going to be the plan. Let me start getting ready for that. 
let's take a closer look at one of these uh, conductive rubber pads. You can see over here there's kind of a cross hash. Oh, let's see if I can see that in the light. Cross hash pattern kind of on them. It's just a very thin rubber disc. And let's test out the, how well this works. So I'm turn this radio on. See it defaults immediately to FM. Let's go back, let's go across to medium wave. And let's just try touching these two pins. Oop. And you can see there, it immediately just flips back. Let's go long wave, try one more time. Yep, that works great. There we can even verify that each one of our lights is actually working just fine as well, which is good news. Wonderful. So that's the theory behind these, is that basically these buttons are just holding the rubber disc in place and getting that to push against these two contacts shorting them out with this conductive rubber, which is enough to, to trigger the switch from this. So what I'm doing now is I've taken a piece of wood and I've just drilled a bunch of 15 64ths holding into it. I found that's just slightly smaller than the size of this button, so it gives it a nice firm grip. You can slide these buttons in there, and they're kind of held in place. This makes the underside face up as well, so it's easy for me to do some work in uh, actually preparing these buttons for a little bit of glue. Look at that, a very nice firm fit. Great, so those are all ready to work with. Now I need to do a similar plan for these two buttons over here. I can see that they actually have a slightly thinner diameter. So I'm going to just drill two slightly smaller holes. There we go. So these are actually six, six sixty-fourths or three thirty-twos uh, in imperial, which is because of what my bits are. So I'm going to just drill two more 332 holes in here so I can pop these in as well. Let me do that now. See how they fit. Perfect. All my buttons are ready to be worked on. Alrighty. Well, let's take our silicon adhesive and let's get to it. I'm going to put a blob here on the left. And then I'm just going to transfer that into here because it might be a little tricky. Ah, then again, maybe I should commit with this tube and just... No, I think I'm still going to do it on the side. This stuff is incredibly messy. I'm going to remove some of this old stuff. Should be plenty for all of them. dry and then see how that does another day. Alrighty, the glue is dried, um, but I'm actually going to take a slightly different course of action with these. 
what you'll see and if I take one of these out here very cautiously that whilst these will probably work mostly okay there we go so I'll see in front of the camera is that there's a slight concaveness to uh, some of these items across the middle like this and that's because the glue doesn't give any support so when you go and put the um, pad on the top and the pad kind of starts to curl a little bit and then you get that slight concave shape which you're seeing over here now I was going to go with that but then suddenly I had a slightly different thought which is I actually want to fill these gaps up here with something a bit more solid and then just glue the pad onto the top you can see over here here's one of the ones I actually removed and this is now got a little bit of silicon glue over there which is kind of taking the shape of that hole and with a little rubber pad stuck to the top which is it's okay it's not perfect but it will probably work very well however then I asked a buddy of mine if he can't just 3d print me a couple of these little spaces now these are it's a metric size these are exactly five millimeter diameter by exactly two millimeters thick you can see over here and these fit absolutely perfectly into each one of these um, little holes so basically we have a flush surface and then I can just go and glue the pad onto that surface so I'm actually going to go ahead and pop these all out and pop these discs back into each of these and then I'm going to glue an, a pad onto that surface and I'm going to go with that part instead uh, so let me go ahead and do that now the pads have now been glued into place they look absolutely brilliant they're kind of poking out by what looks like about a quarter of a millimeter and now I'm going to go and glue these uh, conductor rubber pads onto the top of each one of these which should be a nice flush fit let me go and do that now Alrighty, all of the pads have been glued and now it's time to wait for them to dry for another 24 to 48 hours. See you then. The day has passed and they all look great. Here's all the buttons. They definitely have, have dried. They might not be 100% dry, but I think they're dry enough that I'm actually going to pop them all back into place and let's give it a test run. I'm dying to see how this goes.
Well, let's give it a quick try. I've put most of these buttons back in. These two are not back in yet, but I'm very curious to see how this goes. No sound, I've got no speakers, so that's U, M, L, back to you. A little hard to press, but it works. Three, two, three, four. Sure, it does work, but they're very hard to press. Six is not working at all. Okay, so to see why six is not working, oh, I haven't tried this one yet. This only works on me. Don't know if this button lights up or not. No, oh, it does. Also, it's really hard to press.